Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about skeletal dysplasias today. I'm not going to teach you about individual skeletal dysplasias. What I'm going to teach you about is skeletal dysplasias. What are they? Uh, why are they useful for diagnostic purposes? How we sort of approach someone who's unduly short? Uh, what we look for? Uh, and what types of uh, tests are available to help us work the skeletal dysplasia. Now, I will tell you that I wasn't trained by anyone who knew much about skeletal dysplasias. So my knowledge of skeletal dysplasias in the first 10 years of my career uh, was not good. It certainly wasn't good enough for me. And uh, after about 15 years, I was eligible for a sabbatical. So I decided, well, I was going to learn about skeletal dysplasias. So I went to Germany and worked with Jürgen Stronger, who is the uh, world's expert on skeletal dysplasias, and has written a book that's now, I think, in its fourth edition. And there I learned about skeletal dysplasias. I never got into the man's head. He was German. Germans don't let you get into their heads. <laughs> uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have their their particular uh, careers uh, uh, not challenged. But uh, he taught me a, a lot, and I learned a lot because I had a lot more time. And uh, I, I'll try to impress upon you uh, how unique skeletal dysplasias are in the world of, of birth defects and genetic disorders. I want to apologize for the slides. I did, I made my own slides by a method that I'm not going to tell you about. Uh, but it's, it's not the PowerPoint quality, and, and some of the uh, uh, things did not copy as well. But uh, they copied well enough. Does anyone know the difference between a midget and a dwarf? You do? Tell me. Is it um, proportion? Instead of size? Well, we'll presume that they're both short. You're right. Proportion is what differentiates out someone who's a midget, which is a lay term, versus someone who's a dwarf, which is a lay term. Nanism, or dwarfism, or shortness, is the original term, but then it's been broken down and changed over the years. Um, a dwarf is someone who is disproportionately short. And a midget, or a short person, if you will, is someone who is proportionally short. Why is that important? Well, even though you will see in the statistics that uh, disproportionate dwarfism is common, proportionate short stature is very common. So there's a lot more disorders to know when you have someone who's, who's simply short. If they're disproportionately short, there's many fewer disorders you have to consider. There's many less physical characteristics uh, in uh, proportionally short individuals in most situations than there are distinctive ones in someone who's disproportionately short. So, let's go. Disproportionately short individuals, or, or dwarfs, if you will, it's common, one in 4,000. That's putting them all together. Uh, something like a kind of plasia is more common than this. Something like uh, diastrophic dysplasia is much less common, maybe one in 30,000. But all the dwarfs that we see in our practice uh, are occurring as one in 4,000 frequency you put them together. Look at that last two words, all genetic. Wow. If we had all of our cases that we see of children with birth defects, and we knew before we started that they were gen genetic, we had, would have something to work with. So when you see someone who's disproportionately short, you're already one up on the diagnosis because you know it's genetic, and that's a great advantage. Another reason uh, disproportionate shortness 
where dwarfism is important is it has a high mor morbidity and chronicity. If you're disproportionately short, you can bet that if you survive, and there are a number that won't survive, uh, that uh, it's going to continue. And most of the time, it's going to give you increasing number and serious symptoms. And in some cases, it's lethal uh, in, in two frameworks, actually, maybe three. One, prenatally lethal. Oh, the abortion rate, or I should say stillbirth rate, and the spontaneous abortion rate is around 20, 15 to 20 percent in severely disproportionate uh, individuals in the womb. After that, there's a period of time, depending on how severe it is, that the, there's an increased uh, lethality in the first one to two years. If someone who's disproportionately short survives that period, and many do without any major problems, later on, some of their orthopedic or joint or bone issues can be uh, serious and can cause death, particularly those that have very small chest or those that have cervical spine abnormalities, which many do because there's an increased frequency of dislocation of the upper spine and compression of the cord and uh, arrest of, of breathing. There are also increased uh, frequency in dwarfs of anomalies. Why is that important? Well, it's important diagnostically because that gives you a, a very important anomaly to compare with the type of dwarfism that we'll talk about. You may not know what your, your short, disproportionately short patient has, but if he's got, let's say, an extra finger, wow, that cuts down that one in 4,000 possibility to much less than that of you getting the right diagnosis because maybe 5% of uh, dwarfs have extra fingers. So you've really cut down a number of uh, uh, diagnoses that you have to consider. What if that patient has a cleft palate? Well, you cut that way down too. Just by the associated features, you can get down to almost the diagnosis without thinking, just knowing where to look these, these things up. And Dr. Spronner's book is a good place to look these things up. Another very important thing is you can't usually securely make the diagnosis of a, a specific type of dwarfism from external features. They, they, they can be very tricky and it can lead you astray. But an x-ray uh, of the whole body, which you can do in a young infant easily, are usually pathognomonic. In other words, the features are not repeated in other conditions. And those are fixed. They don't change that dramatically. So the x-rays are very important. So when you see it in someone if they've not had recent x-rays or if they're newborns, they need to get x-rays immediately because there's where you'll confirm the diagnosis. It's like a molecular test almost. And the gene in many of these conditions because they're genetic has been now identified. And there are treatments and interventions possible. Uh, there are many more now than there used to be. Used to be there were none. And now we start to have better ways of treating these patients and helping them do better. Any questions right now? You excited? Yes. Okay, we, we, we've got something we can work with. So many times we see patients that we, they just are frustrated. There's nothing there that we can do except maybe they have mental retardation and maybe they have a little behavior problem. Run with that. <laughs> Here you've got really good stuff to, to deal with. I'm not going to go into this except to say that the definition of a skeletal dysplasia is when there is either an epiphyseal, and we're talking about generalized, metaphyseal or diaphyseal defect. And there can be any combination of those, and we'll go over those so you don't have to remember those. But that consists of a skeletal dysplasia because there's also something that's called skeletal dysostosis, which is more localized abnormality that does not 
involve those three areas of the bone, and we'll talk about those. Just the, the point of the second statement is that genes that are already obviously mutated may not express themselves until after birth in some skeletal dysplasias. They, or they may ex express themselves later in the gestation, or they may start fairly early in the gestation so that uh, uh, scans, uh, ultrasounds, etc., can be very useful. And then uh, there are those tricky ones that uh, uh, if you do it, uh, let's say ultrasounds in the first trimester, you get normal looking bones. Bones only not ossified around 10 feet a week. So that's one of the reasons. And the bones can look very normal at, let's say, the end of the first trimester. And then you do them again, and you say, eh, maybe. And then you do them in the, uh, towards the end of the second trimester, and you say, there's something wrong there. And then as you get further along, you can make the diagnosis uh, in many of these cases. Then there are others that the kids look totally normal at birth, and then later in life, usually, the first couple of years, but it can be up to teenage years actually, even later in the rare conditions, uh, they start to look abnormal. So the gene expression varies depending on the, the condition. Um, just, I'll, I'll go over this a number of different times with future slides. Uh, this is the diaphyses, this area in the middle of the bone. This is the metaphyses. That's the uh, growing part of the bone along with the epiphyses, which is what this is. That's at the end of the bone. I can tell you that these are not normal epiphyses. You see this sort of looks ratty. You can see that the configuration here is, is not good. This is probably the most normal looking epiphysis of the four. This is the femur, the thigh bone. This is the tibia and the fibula. Um, so that's where the epiphyses and epiphyses and diaphyses terms come from, and uh, they're true for all the long bones, they're the, 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 the same. And the width, the length, uh, and the configuration are things we look at to help us decide whether they're normal or not. The only thing that's definitely normal here is these are a little bit thicker, these bones, and you can see the cortex, which is the outside of the bone here, is, is a little bit thicker then it should be, you don't see it as much over here, so there's some bowing of this leg. And we've already talked about the epiphyses not being regular. And the metaphyses are wide. And these are things that you may not be able to tell now, but other people can help you uh, by looking at the x-rays. The person who looks at x-rays a lot, or the radiologist, can give you an idea of whether they are abnormal. And this configuration in the metaphyses uh, they can have little spurs here, they can be irregular, they can invaginate, they can do a ton of different things that give the observer more information to categorize the uh, patient's uh, bone findings. And this is this talks about scalable dysostosis, which is cut off here. Uh, but, oops. Again, the example, a, a child who's missing a radius or where the radius is small generally does not have a skeletal dysplasia because there's missing bone and that's not usually part of skeletal dysplasias. The ulnar mammillary syndrome, which I'll show you a picture of in a few minutes, just has the distal part of the ulna missing. And so it's a, more of a dysostosis. And then cleidocranial dysostosis, uh, it's sort of one of those conditions that could be either a dysostosis or a dysplasia because it has a more generalized involvement even though the clavicle or collarbone in this condition is usually either underdeveloped or missing. Here's a girl who has a skeletal dysostosis. Her long bones are fine. It's her upper spine where the cervical spine may be three or four uh, cervical vertebra are fused. And that makes the neck shorter because there's no disc in between them. And the, the chin will sit almost on the chest. So that's one of the classic skeletal dysostoses. 
here you see the fusion. You don't see the, the separation in between these, but most of these upper cervical vertebrae, maybe down to C5, are fused, and that makes the neck very short. These are pic pictures of the ulna mammary syndrome. And <coughs> see the ulna here, the distal portion near the wrist, should go all the way up to the uh, radius here, but it doesn't. So it's missing there. And notice up here what's missing, the fifth finger. Often when you have the ulna missing at its distal tip, uh, or the whole ulna for that matter, which is rare, uh, you will not have a normal fifth finger. It will be underdeveloped, short, or in this case missing. This, the reason that this is called ulna mammary syndrome is because the affected individuals don't have hardly any nipple or breast development. So they, they, it, the nipples are very hypoplastic. There are other features, but this is a good example of a skeletal dysostosis, not a skeletal dysplasia. We've already talked a little bit about genes and uh, conditions that manifest in utero. Uh, there are many I could have put up here, but more common ones, osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, they, their bones can look fairly normal at birth and then fractures occur afterwards, but generally speaking, they're going to have abnormal bones at birth. And the more abnormal the bones are, the more likely they are to have had intrauterine fractures. And then there's SED, spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia. We'll talk a little bit about how we categorize conditions. Congenita, meaning it's present at birth, which infers it was present before birth. And that's why the individual is short. Then you have pseudoachondroplasia, which usually does not present at birth, but within the first two years, the individuals start to be short, have abnormal spines. Also, the multiple pepsial dysplasias, if that's all they have, and remember that's the end of the growing part of the bone, that's the only abnormality they have. That may not show up as short stature for a number of years, or it may show up with decreasing growth rate. And the diastrophe dysplasia has both prenatal and postnatal, and it's quite unique in many ways that we'll talk about. Okay. Skeletal dysplasia, pure. That, that's all you've got. You've got either bifseal, metaphseal, or diphseal, or some combination of involvement, but no other features. Then we have uh, skeletal dysplasia with multiple general anomalies. And I put SD slash MCA for that. We have skeletal dysplasia with multiple, excuse me, with MCA, multiple general anomalies, and little retardation. Uh, and again, each of these divisions help you decide and increase the chances you'll be able to make a diagnosis. So, and here's skeletal dysplasia with mental retardation. Uh, very few skeletal dysplasias just have mental retardation along with their skeletal dysplasia. Good example of this would be hypochondroplasia, which we will talk about a little bit later. Again, I apologize for my uh, uh, photography, uh, not photography, but my putting my, these slides together. These are uh, individuals here and here uh, with a very severe skeletal dysplasia. And what I want to show you is the bowing. Short bones more often than not tend to bow. Bones that are, are, that are narrow and not well ca calcified also tend to bow, like an osteogenesis imperfecta and sometimes fractured. There will often be dimples, and I'll show you a picture of that later, at the area of the maximum bowing, and that's dimples of the skin, and that's because the bone is closer to the skin than it normally is, and the skin is pulled down. Here you can see some bowing. There's, we're not going to talk much about the pelvis or the spine today, except to uh, put it in general categories, but the, each of these features here are abnormal. They don't look abnormal, but they are. And the more you know about skeletal dysplasias, the sooner you'll be able to pick it up. And very characteristic in this condition is the head of the femur or thigh bone. Here's how we describe these conditions. The pifsil dysplasia, ED, or MED, which means multiple pifsil dysplasia. The pifsil dysplasia doesn't 
it isn't. You just don't have epiphyseal dysplasia, usually of one epiphyses. So almost all the epiphyseal dysplasias are going to involve multiple epiphyses at the ends of the long bone. The metaphyseal dysplasia, MD, and the diaphyseal dysplasia, DD, and the spondylo means spine. And when you have a spondylo uh, or spine involvement in one of these others, then we combine them uh, for terminology. Each of these uh, have different degrees of specificity or lack of specificity, particularly the epiphyseal dysplasias. And then I'm going on because I've already discussed this with you. So, we have epiphyseal involvement, we put spine and, and spine involvement, we say spondylo epiphyseal dysplasia, SED. If we have metaphyseal dysplasia, we call it and spine involvement, spondylo metaphyseal dysplasia, or SMD. If we have uh, spine involvement with both epiphyseal, epi, and metaphyseal dysplasia, it's SEMD, spondylo epiphyseal metaphyseal dysplasia. These are important because they narrow down the number of conditions you have to think about and look up. This, this is, is the most common combination. This is second most common. And this is unusual and quite, quite rare. So you have both the epiphyses and metaphyses and the spine involved. You have a very small number of conditions uh, to uh, consider. These are the vertebrae, just, just to go over a few things. Normally the vertebrae are sort of boxed configuration, like this. We consider these normal vertebrae. There's a normal distance here. The borders, anterior, posterior, superior, inferior, are usually straight. And then you get platyspondyly, which means flat spine. And in order to get flat spine, this height here has to be reduced. And so these are examples of platyspondyly. The meeting has ended because it had only one participant for the last 30 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. If you have a flat spine, that means the, uh, excuse me, flat vertebra, that means the vertebra is not anatomically normal. And sometimes the uh, anatomy will, this, this even area, even though the vertical distance decreases, it may dip, or it may mound, or this part may come forward, like you see here. And here's the dip. On, this is on the forward side. And you, you have, there's all different combinations of how the vertebra look. So when you take a, a, the x-rays, you want to get a frontal x-ray and a lateral x-ray. And you can tell from the uh, types of vertebral anomalies what general configuration they are, and some of them are unique enough to, to make you suspect, particularly metabolic disorders, have very characteristic uh, uh, vertebral formation, and they get worse over time. And others uh, are, are slow to show changes. So one of the things that we do when we have an individual with, uh, with, uh, sp with skeletal dysplasia that we've not been able to diagnose is we repeat the x-rays. The first year, probably repeat them at least twice. Uh, so three times total if, if you don't have a, a uh, actual diagnosis. After that, once per year, up to around five years of age, and you'd be amazed at the, how quickly the x-rays can change once they start to change, and how they go from non-specific changes to very dramatic and specific changes. And x-rays are still one of the cheapest tests we can get. And when you have a disproportionate individual, uh, it's important to repeat those. Another descriptor that we use uh, in regards to limbs is the term rhizomelia, which means proximal shortening. Mesomelia, middle shortening. And acromelia, meaning distal shortening, which means the hands are short. And when you have a mixture, like acromesomelia, it's both acro and the middle portion of the limb that's short. Now, I don't want you to think that it's all this neat a package. It's not. Many 
of the uh, short individuals who are disproportionately short are going to have all the bones short. But some of the bones are going to be shorter than the others. And so when you're naming these, you use that to, to categorize your condition. Uh, and that's particularly true when you're talking about rhizomelia, which the aconoplastic has, and mesomelia, which the uh, Leary wheel syndrome has. Uh, the, these are important differences because in many of these conditions, all the long bones are normal, but there's one particular segment that is more abnormal. Rhizomelia here is a proximal shortening of the uh, upper arm. Mesomelia, look how much shorter this is relative to this bone than this is to this bone. So this is a mesomelic condition. Here's acromelia, all the fingers are short. Now you can tell this is fairly extreme, so you can tell that the hands are going to be short clinically, and the x-ray is going to tell you why it's short. What are the anatomical uh, occurrences that are making it so short? And some of the syndromes are actually named after these are categorized, though. The mesomelic dysplasias, if you will, uh, is a term that's commonly used. Acromelia is commonly used as well. Not necessarily correctly, but uh, people take shortcuts uh, when they can. Major complications of skeletal dysplasias. We've talked about some of them, and we're talking about disproportionate. Bowing and joint problems are almost a given in individuals with skeletal dysplasias eventually assuming that they uh, otherwise uh, have, a, have a normal lifespan. Many will develop spinal curvatures, and these spinal curvatures can be present at birth, may not be present for the first 10 years of uh, life, and, and become quite dramatic later in the, in the second decade. Depending on the size of the, of the chest, and some of these disorders that we see are going to have a small chest or rib cage or thorax, will have respiratory problems and recurrent pneumonias. And the, sh the smaller the chest, the harder it is to breathe, the harder it is for it to have a, a tracheal tolic and the increased frequency of pneumonias. We've mentioned that some of these are lethal. Uh, this is probably the most common cause, a respiratory cause. But remember we said that some of the uh, skeletal dysplasia is going to have cervical spine compression, and that can cause death as well. And then the associated anomalies that we see, again, can be very useful in diagnosis. We know from studies that the individuals who have disproportionate shortness have a poor body image. But it's getting better for some of the conditions. I've forgotten the TV channel, TLC, has the aconoplastic dwarfs living together and talking and stuff. It, it's made being a dwarf uh, more compatible with a normal life and body image uh, than before. Many of the dwarfs, unfortunately, become obese. Some because it's genetically programmed for them to become obese, and many because uh, they don't have as much body to put on any fat, so whatever they eat, the fat deposits, and they become obese. And this can become life-threatening. This is a child with a very unusual uh, Mennonite uh, uh, family. This child has very large joints at the end. You can see here how large the knee is. This is because the metaphyses are extremely large and irregular. And this child eventually died of, uh, uh, of uh, an immune problem and secondary infections. He has a very rare condition called metatrophic dwarfism. But the x-rays are pathognomonic of this, uh, not the clinical features you see here, although uh, you can make some educated guesses. And this again is uh, my attempt to uh, take a picture of the x-ray that uh, didn't work. Sorry. Lethality and skeletal dysplasias. We talked about this uh, quite a bit. I'm just looking at things. We didn't talk too much about the postnatal or early lethality that's due to the small thorax. There's a whole group of uh, conditions in which small thorax 
and then anomaly, particularly polydactyly, are used. There's men's and women's names for some of these. Noonan syndrome, uh, Sadino Noonan, Majewski uh, syndrome, where the chest is so small that almost all the children are going to have severe respiratory trouble, and many of those children are going to die. Postnatal uh, later, uh, many will have a debilitation because of their orthopedic problems in their small chest. Uh, and we've talked about the infections and these other uh, findings that, that reduce the lifespan. Here are two different individuals with uh, thoracic dystrophy, which is another term used for small chest. Uh, here it's very obvious that this individual has a small chest. And a newborn, because they have extra fat on their, their body, this can sometimes be hidden. So an x-ray can sometimes show a small chest when clinically, in bottom tape measures, the chest is not small. But uh, it is small from the standpoint of osseous. This also used to be called a Jeune's asphyxiating thoracic dystrophy, better now known as thoracic dystrophy. And uh, this is a, these children are normal otherwise intellectually. They do have an increased frequency of urinary tract problems, particularly kidney uh, degeneration, and they can survive and seem to be doing well. Uh, if they get through the neonatal period and in early infancy and then have severe difficulties with renal function later in life. Polydactyly occasionally occurs in this condition and that makes it be, be confused with a number of other conditions with short stature that's disproportionate. The recognition, we're trying to think of an approach to the diagnosis. You first have to recognize that a child is disproportionately short. A, a standard measurement is good uh, if the shortness is there at that time. Uh, and if it's not there, then you need to, to re-measure the individual periodically. And then we talked about categorization of the body areas involved. We talked about the radiological features that uh, uh, can be pathognomonic and are pathognomonic in almost all the conditions. How important any associated anomalies can reduce the, the fairly large number of conditions you have to consider. And then the recognition of marker features. Marker features are features that you didn't originally see. And then these could be clinical or radiological, or both. And as you follow the individuals, things change. You see something that clues you into a particular diagnosis that you hadn't thought of before. That's called a marker feature, and that's one of the reasons to continue to follow these individuals uh, and to continue to re-X-ray them. And then the genome med box studies uh, as needed. And I should say, in this day and age, the gene studies are done whether they're needed or not uh, as fast as possible. Um, let's see. This, this guy has a midline cleft. This is an individual with a uh, lethal condition. Note how small the chest is. Makes the gap and look very prominent. And look here, he's got an extra finger. So this is a guaranteed, make a diagnosis of skeletal dysplasia, which is, however, usually lethal. Uh, this girl shows the typical dimple. She has cauliflower-like ears. She has diastrophic dysplasia. Diastrophic dysplasia, diastrophic means twisted you're talking about spine means scoliosis. But they have many other features, including this dimple. It used to be called dimple dwarfism for a while, but people figured out that this is a secondary feature of both limbs. If we're looking for a short trunk, um, which is usually, if it is short, it's going to be deformed, there may be a pectus excavatum or prominent chest or an indented chest, pectus excavatum. Measurements uh, in the presence of a short chest are very important, but can be misleading if there's a lot of extra fat. Small thorax, uh, frequently the, they'll be asymmetric as well, small, and they'll frequently be associated with scoliosis, kyphosis, which is a bending of the spine posteriorly, and that can occur in any, any segment of the spine, and as we showed you, uh, the neck is short, it doesn't have to be fused, 
And some skeletal dysplasias will have short necks because the vertebrae are short. Here's a child with uh, spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia congenita. You can see he has a curved spine, but this is bent backward, not prominent like this. And this is lower dosis. And uh, you can see that uh, his head looks relatively large to his body, which it is, and that the limbs look relatively short. You see another dimple here, but this is not where we see the bowling. This is at the elbow. And unfortunately, uh, dimples occur normally at the elbow, so it's not much use. When a child who you think may be disproportionately short is a newborn and young infant, take their arms and put them down by their, their sides, with the, either the child standing up or stretched out. In the young infant, the hands will normally fall below the hip level, but not very far below. If the, if the fingers fall higher than that, that's a sign of disproportionate. When you have an older child, normally the hands will fall to the mid thigh. If they fall to the upper thigh, that's another sign of disproportionate. It doesn't specifically tell you if the spine's short or the arms are short as the basis of the disproportion, but it says that there is disproportion. We've talked about Boeing. And it can be quite mild, not even clinically obvious to do the x-ray. We talk about skin dimples. And skin creases at the uh, concavity of the bowling can occur. We, brachydactyly is another term for short fingers. And there's a pattern to every form of brachydactyly. In fact, they listed at least A, B, C, D, E, F, and subtypes of those to because they have different patterns of which digits, which phalanges, which metacarpals, and which carpals are involved, and how they're involved, and many times they are involved in unique patterns that in and of themselves can actually help you with the diagnosis. People are talking about this feature of determining short disproportionate limbs. Here you see skin creases uh, on the inner side. Uh, that sometimes happens, particularly if the child has a lot of fat tissue. So not only are dimples on the other side over here where the bowling is most marked, but you can get, depending on how much uh, skin tissue you have, extra, uh, you can get uh, creases here. And uh, the, the, sometimes you will have, like this is sometimes called the sandal gap, Abnormality. It's not specific at all for skeletal dysplasias, but it's found in a number of uh, multiple anomaly syndromes. You can see that the nails are small. Those are important things because there's four or five disorders uh, involving skeletal dysplasias where the nails are either small or missing. So if you just see that and you cut your, your list and differential way down. Uh, so the diagnosis is more than likely. Fainter creases here, but this tells you that the the femur is involved as well as the tibia. We talked about polydactyly, but, which is probably the best feature with the skeletal dysplasia to lead you to a specific diagnosis. But cleft palate is also increased in frequency uh, in skeletal dysplasias. Most uh, classic one is diastrophic dysplasia, and I'll show you some pictures of that. If there are heart defects, and there is increased frequency of heart defects in, in skeletal dysplasias. The most common one is Alice Van Crevel, in which the chambers of the upper portion are missing as far as the septum is concerned, and you have a single atrium rather than two atrium. And then, for some reason, we don't know why, individuals with disproportionate short stature have a high frequency of these birthmarks that in many babies uh, are up on the mid-forehead, upper nose, and occasionally on the nasal tip. But these children have an increased frequency, if they're disproportionately short, of hemangiomas even further down and more dramatic. And those also go away. They're not otherwise pathologic, but they're a common accompaniment. As is the same hemangiomas in children who have limb deficiencies, particularly specifically of the upper limbs. They have a high frequency of these mid-facial hemangiomas, again, which go away over time. 
And we talked about cladocranial the particular agenesis. There's now maybe 10 disorders of clavicular agenesis. Uh, but again, that's a lot less than the uh, hundreds that you have to consider uh, if you don't have that feature. And even there's the little, uh, there are no human tails, by the way, but they look like tails. They're called pseudo tails. And metatropic dysplasia uh, has <coughs> a high frequency of pseudo tails, which is a prominence of the lower spine that juts out and looks a little bit, a little bit like a tail. And there are many other uh, useful features as well. The cystic ears, dystrophic dysplasia, fractures, obviously uh, osteocystic defective, sex reversal, the individual's carrying type doesn't match the external genotype, or not uh, genotype, but phenotype. Immune deficiency, there's maybe four or five disorders involving the skeletal uh, disproportionate individuals that have immune deficiencies of various types. Renal cyst, we talked about saline on union. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, thoracic dystrophy. And all of these are not necessarily obvious at birth, so they can be cryptic and be marker features and follow-up. Now, I'll cut his head off here. He has dystrophic dysplasia. You can see he has a little bit of a small chest. Not very much. You have to, you have to look a little bit more carefully with an educated eye. The abdomen is relatively large, which is not unusual for a lot of babies, but it appears more so here. Um, and then you see the thumbs are tucked forward and uh, almost across the palm. This is the hitchhiker's thumb uh, that, that has been described in dystrophic dysplasia because the first bone that supports the thumb is underdeveloped. So it allows the thumb to deviate out, in some cases to deviate in. You can see some creases, more creases than you normally see, up higher than the, the normal joint. These children have a cleft palate. They also have these ears that look like they have little balloons or cystic areas in them, like cauliflower ears sometimes they're called because of the boxers who get hit so often that their ears swell up and they get calcium in them and then they look irregular and, and swollen. Uh, but this is something that can occur before birth, at, be present at birth, or not be present at all and not start to be cystic until two months of age. And then there's conditions that are not pure skeletal dysplasias. And they're the 1% that aren't genetic, usually. And particularly when we're talking about drugs. Warfarin embryopathy, which is, warfarin is used as an anticoagulant uh, and when mothers have throm thromboses in their legs, um, uh, they have to be put on anticoagulant when they're pregnant. Uh, and this is one that you don't want to put them on because it has a, a direct effect on vitamin K deficiency. The child comes out with uh, multiple defects, including uh, skeletal defects, specifically stippled epiphyses, these are modeled epiphyses. And the vitamin D deficiency rickets and the pseudo or pseudo pseudo hyperparathyroidism. And the mucopolysaccharidosis can look very much like a skeletal dysplasia, even though they have unique uh, radiological features. There is a time element involved uh, where originally they may not show anything very dramatic, if anything, and only later uh, months to, to years will show a more specific pattern. And they may, the first thing that may show up is a drop in the growth curve before they have uh, their delayed development recognized. And they can also have uh, cervical dislocations and compressions and death because of those, of those features. Uh, here are, are two individuals who have warfarin embryopathy. It causes the nose to be very flat and the bridge to be very flat. Uh, why is it important that uh, we recognize that this can cause a flat nasal bridge? Because many dwarfing conditions uh, have a flat nasal bridge as one of the major features. And that flat bridge often does not grow back out to the normal level. Unfortunately, you can't see the epiphyses here, but they're stippled. You can see the little dots uh, in the uh, bones of the uh, ankle. 
This we've already talked about in many ways. You're already aware that almost all of these conditions have genes identified and have the location, obviously, of the genes. Uh, and this is why it's important that we know that a disproportionate individual is going to be uh, at high likelihood of having it on a genetic basis, which can be tested. And then there's families. This is not news to you, but it was to me for many years. We knew the phenotypes of the uh, achondroplastic and hypochondroplastic individuals were very similar. Achondroplastic being a little bit more severe uh, and not having no retardation. Excuse me. Uh, and then we uh, did not know for sure that there was actually a, a lethal form of this gene that we were seeing so-called phenotophoric dwarfism. Phenotophoric means death-bearing because almost all these children die in the first, I would say, weeks to uh, maybe stretch it out on rare occasions to six months of age. Uh, these children also had very uh, abnormal cr craniums with few sutures, etc. But these are all the same gene with mutations that are different, but with different uh, outcomes and uh, in some cases different phenotypes, but not so different that you, if you've got x-rays of each of these, you could get a hint, as did Spronger when he developed the concept of family of, of uh, disorders, family meaning same gene, different phenotype, that he was seeing enough of the phenotype on the x-rays to make him think that these were, in fact, related. Same thing with the DTDST or on the 5Q that I showed dysplasia, which you see a patient of in two lethal conditions, same gene, again, mutations or different types of mutations within the same gene, same thing here. Uh, again, the phenotypes can be similar, but often uh, until we know the gene, uh, we weren't able to tell some of these apart with security. Again, my great photography, but uh, this is an individual who has hypochondroplasia, achondroplasia, uh, Achondroplasts tend to have a, a relatively large head, and the hypochondroplastics tend to have a large head that is not as large. They also tend to have a higher frequency or a high frequency of mild mental retardation. This is an individual with thanatophoric, and you can see he's in distress with an open mouth, very small chest. Actually, the chest is much smaller than it looks because we, I, I've said, and people around me have said, that chest doesn't look that small for the type of respiratory problems that patient's having. And then you take an x-ray, the chest is much smaller than we thought it was. And here's a child with the type 2 thanatophoric dwarfism with the uh, skeleton and with a very distorted head, multiple sutures fused, uh, with a skull that's often called cleavage shaped skull. Okay, I'm going to skip this one. That out of uh, saliva. And these are just some of the uh, treatments that are possible periodically uh, and gene replacement and some of the uh, treatments for OI being the best. Uh, indirect treatments, uh, surgery, casting, braces, and stretching the bones and letting the bone grow in between is something that's used frequently, not frequently, but it's used sometimes for achondroplasia. And it's important to remember that features change over time in many of these. The delayed mat maturation of the bones makes interpretation difficult. Again, repeated x-rays. The non osseous features may uh, be a clue. Growth patterns in unknown uh, spinal epithelial dysplasias are unpredictable, so you need follow-up on all these kids to see uh, what their growth pattern is. Sometimes the growth pattern will, will change dramatically and give you a clue to the, what's going on. And as new tests appear, uh, and or we get smarter, uh, diagnosis is even going to be higher in skeletal dysplasias. Okay, that's it. Questions, comments? How successful, um, on your previous slide, I noticed a, a drug regimen, how successful does that tend to be? Well, that's, that's a mixed bag. Um, it's been successful. It's not cured the individual. And the individual still has problems. It's reduced the severity of the bone problem and made it 
less severe, but it, 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 with a few exceptions, it has a cure in the patient. And I'm specifically talking about a lie. And okay. I think I've seen, I, I can't remember if this was Cruzon or Abert, but um, it was a TV surgery show, so I, you know, I know very sensational, I guess, but they had done, um, they brought the face, uh, cut and brought the face forward so that they could make mm -hmm. just a, a straight line um, uh, cut with the spacers. Um, when you do that level of intervention, I think this child was already seven when, you, when it was done. Uh, the, those are, are that's called uh, facial advancement, mm -hmm. and that's a, the procedure is called Tessier's procedure. He has three or four. He's used for very severe cranial synostosis uh, individuals who have lots of facial uh, compression, uh, ocular the nerves gets get compressed as well, and so in some of those individuals it's. At, warranted and successful. It's a horrendous surgery for the individuals to go through, but in good hands, experienced hands, it can improve the individual's uh, features dramatically. But that's not a skeletal dysplasia. You can't take just the skull. If that's the only part that's abnormal, whether it's an osseous problem or not, that's not going to fit into our definition of skeletal dysplasia because everything else is normal. And you notice that the, the terms that we use didn't include the head in any of them. So that's the, it's a different situation. All right, thank you, Mary, very much. Thank you.